Hello, medicals. <clears throat> Good day to all of you. So this is Dr. B K for you, and today I will be discussing about the posterior media stena. Hope you would remember that we have already discussed about the media stena and about the. various subdivisions of the media stena into superior and then inferior the inferior is again divided into anterior middle and posterior media stena so superior media stena already we have discussed in detail about the contents boundaries extent and also about the in detail about the arch of aorta superior vena cava trachea anterior mediastinum not much important structures are present apart from some sternopericardial ligaments loose areolar tissue middle mediastinum we have discussed in detail about the pericardium and the heart so today in the posterior mediastinum we will be in short just revising our boundaries and contents which we have already done in the initial media stenum class and then few structures mainly the esophagus we will be discussing about the gross anatomy of the esophagus its extent relations and its innervation and blood supply including its applied anatomy then about thoracic duct the largest lymphatic vessel in our body and then in brief about the descending thoracic aorta okay so mainly we will be concentrating on esophagus thoracic duct okay so a short recap of the media stenum i told you that it is a septum in the midline or the space between the two lungs or you can consider it as a septum which separates the two lungs and its pleura mediastinal surface of two lungs and its pleura it is divided into superior and inferior by an imaginary plane passing through the sternal angle or angle of louis so in front the manubrio sternal joint and uh, behind intervertebral disc between t4 and t5 so beyond that the inferior mediastinum is divided into anterior middle and posterior media stenum so we will directly pass on to the posterior media stenum the boundaries of posterior media stenum above it is the imaginary plane passing through the sternal angle below the diaphragm okay posteriorly what you have is the lower eighth thoracic vertebra with its intervertebral discs behind our posteriorly what you see is the from fifth to the 12th thoracic vertebra with its intervertebral discs from the posterior limit anteriorly you have the posterior wall of the middle mediastinum so mainly the bifurcation of trachea heart with its pericardium and the posterior sloping surface of the diaphragm okay the posterior sloping surface the fibrous pericardium posterior surface of the fibrous pericardium of the heart and that is the bifurcation of the trachea posterior relations already i told you from the lower border of t4 to t12 and on either side you have the mediastinal surface of the lung with its pleural covering so that is the boundaries or the extent of the posterior mediastinum now we will try to enumerate the structures structures basically we can classify the structures into which are vertically or longitudinal in orientation then structures which are lying transversely or across 
longitudinal structures two main structures you see here is the esophagus and the descending thoracic aorta okay so mainly you see the esophagus and to the left of esophagus what you see is the descending thoracic aorta these two are the major structures you can appreciate very well in the posterior mediastinum longitudinal or vertical structures then other vertical structures you come across is the azagos vein <coughs> azagos vein is not shown here only the termination arch of azagos vein is shown here so in this you can see the azagos vein if the azagos vein is to the right side left side you will see the accessory and hemiazagos and hemiazagos veins okay accessory hemiazagos and then the hemiazagos vein then what you see is the next uh, vertical structure is the thoracic duct it is seen behind and to the right of esophagus in the lower part posterior mediastinum okay but at the level of sternal angle it deviates from the right side to the left side so these are the longitudinal structures esophagus descending thoracic aorta azagos vein then this side you will have the hemiazagos and accessory hemiazagos then you see the thoracic duct then what other structures you come across is vagus nerve and then the sympathetic chain okay so you come across the vagus nerve right and left vagus nerve and the sympathetic chain of course branches from the sympathetic chain also can be considered splanchnic nerves they are called as the greater lesser and the least splanchnic nerves branches of the sympathetic chain transverse structures mainly you see the termination of the azagos veins the not the azagos uh, accessory and the hemiazagos accessory hemiazagos and azagos turning to actually drain into the azagos vein then mainly the posterior intercostal vessels right especially the right one because the descending thoracic aorta is present to the left of the midline so all these posterior intercostal arteries they have to cross the midline to go to the right side so posterior intercostal arteries then you come across posterior mediastinal lymph nodes okay posterior or mediastinal lymph nodes posterior mediastinal lymph nodes you come across so mainly transverses termination of as a hemiazagos and accessory hemiazagos posterior intercostal vessels some books also refer the crossing of thoracic duct from the right side to left side but that again happens only at the level of sternal angle and the level of t4 so which is almost the upper border of the posterior mediastinum so with a short introduction on the esophagus on the contents of the posterior mediastinum and uh, the boundaries and extent of the posterior mediastinum now we we'll pass on to the esophagus so you all know that esophagus is simply called as the food pipe in a layman's term muscular tube long muscular tube okay total length is around 25 cm extent starts from the pharyngoesophageal junction so where the pharynx terminates and then the esophagus starts at the level of sixth cervical vertebra pierces the diaphragm and ends at the 11th thoracic vertebra t10 it pierces the diaphragm at the 11th thoracic vertebra at the level of t11 it actually ends into the stomach cardiac end of the stomach okay so at the level of 
the sixth cervical pharyngoesophageal junction this pharyngoesophageal junction is called as the second narrowest part of gastrointestinal tract first narrowest or the most narrowest part of GAT is your appendix pharyngoesophageal junction is only secondary to the appendix so from there it starts at the level of sixth cervical vertebra this is also the starting point of the trachea larynx continues as trachea c6 pharynx continues as esophagus at the level of sixth cervical vertebra then it enters the superior mediastinum and then continues downwards into the posterior mediastinum pierces the diaphragm at the level of 10th thoracic vertebra at the level of T10 it pierces the diaphragm are you able to understand and then at the level of T11 opens into the cardiac end of the stomach now just before piercing the diaphragm at T10 it comes to lie anterior to the descending thoracic aorta Above the T8 or T9 level, it was present almost to the right of the descending thoracic aorta. At T8, T9, it comes anteriorly and then pierces the diaphragm at T10 and opens into the cardiac end of the stomach at the level of T11, 11th thoracic vertebra. The esophagus shows certain curvatures <coughs> or bending. It shows both bending anteroposterior curvatures as well as lateral curvatures. Anteroposterior deviation or bending that actually corresponds to the curvatures of your vertebral column. Cervical it is actually convex to the front, thoracic it is to the concave to the front. Okay. So, those curvatures are anteroposterior. Lateral curvatures, that is to the sides, it deviates to the left side. Actually, it deviates to the left side twice. Okay. So, that is why you can see the mediastinal impression in the left lung for the esophagus at two places. Whereas, to the right, it is seen only in the middle uh, behind the hilum of the right lung only at one place in the right lung you can see but on the left lung you can see the impressions for the esophagus at two places so because the esophagus deviates to the left twice so, only at two places it is in the midline once at its commencement at the level of sixth cervical vertebra and then when it crosses in front of the descending thoracic iota. Okay. Just before that T5 to T7. T8, T9 it actually crosses and comes almost to the left side. Okay. Only at two places in the middle only C6 and other one is T5, T6, T7 opposite T5 to T7, it is in the midline. So, here you are able to see the <coughs> esophagus. So, it is actually crossing in front of the iota and O pierces the diaphragm at the level of T10. T8, T9, it is anterior to the descending thoracic iota. So, curvatures you are able to see above cervical curvature and then that is the thoracic curvature which is concave to the front, cervical curvature convex. So, the esophagus also what happens is it follows the same curvatures. Lateral curvatures to the left side it deviates twice, it deviates to the left side from the left of the midline twice. Now, next important thing which you should know is about the constrictions of the esophagus. The esophagus shows some natural constrictions mainly at four places. First is at the level of C6, 
that is the junction of the esophagus and pharynx pharyngoesophageal junction that is 6 inches from the incisor teeth central incisors from there 6 inches the next is actually when it is crossed by the arch of aorta that is at the level of T4 9 inches from the incisor next when it is crossed by the root of left lung or left bronchus 11 inches from the incisor at the level of 6th thoracic vertebra C6, T4, T6 and finally when it is actually piercing the diaphragm at the level of T7, T10 which is 15 to 16 inches from the central incisor T. So at these places you can see the esophagus as a natural constriction which you should be aware of it. So, a radiograph showing the natural constrictions which should not be mistaken for any esophageal obstruction, neoplasm, growth or erosion due to chronic esophagitis. Okay. So, knowledge of the position of these constrictions are very much essential. One is at the level of its commencement pharyngoesophageal junction the other one when it is crossed by the arch of iota the third one is when it is crossed by the left bronchus and the fourth one is when it pierces the diaphragm at the level of 10th thoracic vertebra now we just uh, try to understand the relations anteriorly mainly the relations which are mentioned here is only for the thorax in the superior mediastinum, you have the trachea, then arch of iota, left principal bronchus, then fibrous pericardium and the posterior sloping surface of diaphragm in the posterior mediastinum. Okay. So, left principal bronchus, posterior surface of the fibrous pericardium and posterior surface of the diaphragm. In the neck, in front it is related to the trachea and in the groove between the trachea and esophagus, tracheoesophageal groove, you have the recurrent laryngeal nerve. In the neck especially both sides you have right and left recurrent laryngeal nerve. And on the sides here it will be related to the thyroid gland, lateral lobe of the thyroid gland and common carotid artery. So the common carotid artery which is arising from the arch of iota, they all will form the lateral relations for the cervical part of esophagus. Posterior relations behind the esophagus, mainly what you see is the thoracic duct. Then termination of the hemiazygos and accessory hemiazygos, they will turn to terminate into the azygos vein. Then what you see is the descending thoracic iota, which was to the left. Then becomes posterior because the esophagus at the level of T8, T9 comes to the front of the iota just before piercing the diaphragm and then you have the intercostal arteries, right posterior intercostal arteries, thoracic duct in the lower part behind and to the right of esophagus. Then what you have is the Descending thoracic iota, termination of the accessory amazegos and amazegos and right posterior intercostal arteries. Then what else you come across? Apart from that on each side you have the corresponding lung and the vagus nerve, right and left vagus nerve. At the lower part of the esophagus, both these vagus nerve, they form an esophageal plexus. Esophageal plexus. This is actually a combination of both sympathetic and parasympathetic. The parasympathetic component is mainly by the vagus nerve, right and left vagus nerve. So, we have seen mainly about the constrictions, then the relations of the esophagus. Blood supply mainly it is supplied from above downwards esophageal branches of inferior thyroid artery, branches from descending thoracic iota, 
branches from left gastric artery okay inferior thyroid descending thoracic aorta left gastric left inferior phrenic artery and then the left bronchial artery mainly the bronchial artery also supplies the esophagus okay branches from the inferior thyroid descending thoracic aorta direct branches esophageal branches bronchial artery left gastric and left inferior phrenic arteries venous drainage inferior thyroid vein upper part cervical part actually drains into the inferior thyroid vein then into the azygos vein thoracic part into the azygos vein abdominal it drains both into the left gastric via to the portal vein and through the hemiazygos into the cable system venous cable system systemic veins abdominal part bifurcates one into actually the portal vein by the left gastric vein and the part of the esophagus into the hemiazygos vein and there is anastomosis between the left gastric and hemiazygos vein in cases of increased portal tension it is portal hypertension so what happens is these veins might rupture causing esophageal varices so esophageal varices will be formed and this might rupture uh, leading to hematemesis or vomiting of blood portal hypertension one of the sites is actually the gastric veins and the veins of hemiazygos esophageal gastric veins and hemiazygos veins they anastomose it is a site of porto systemic anastomosis lymphatics the upper part mainly drains cervical part into jugulo homohyoid nodes thoracic part into paratracheal then you have the tracheo bronchial lymph nodes and posterior mediastinal nodes abdomen it drains to the celiac nodes mainly drains to the celiac nodes abdominal part thoracic part posterior mediastinal nodes tracheo bronchial nodes okay nerve supply parasympathetic is by the vagus nerve right and left vagus they form a plexus in the lower part of the esophagus from that what arises is the anterior vagal trunk in front and behind what arises is the posterior vagal trunk so left vagus becomes anterior vagal right vagal becomes the posterior vagal trunk posterior vagal trunk is larger parasympathetic is actually sensory motor and secretory motor to the esophagus sympathetic is from cervical part upper middle and inferior cervical ganglia lower part is upper four thoracic ganglia sympathetic chain they also take part in the esophageal plexus that is about the nerve supply of the esophagus now one condition what you see here is the achalasia cardia or cardiac spasm in this what happens is the lower esophageal sphincter fails to relax and the upper part is actually dilated with the food contents almost the food is arrested near the lower part of the esophagus so an endoscopic view shows you see the lumen of the esophagus is completely closed even though there is no anatomical sphincter there is only a physiological sphincter lower esophageal sphincter so this produces a condition called cardiac spasm or achalasia cardia because the nerve bodies the nerve cells are actually absent in the wall of the esophagus congenital absence of these nerve cells in the esophagus leads to a condition called achalasia cardia so thereby the gastroesophageal junction is completely narrowed or closed and the upper part of the esophagus is dilated so neuromuscular incoordination because they fail to relax due to the absence of nerve cells when the food is swallowed 
so it is mostly congenital might be due to the failure of the neural crest cells to migrate into this area and these nerve cells are post ganglionic parasympathetic neurons next uh, most of us would have experienced this heartburn or esophagitis so you feel a burning sensation behind your sternum that is because the reflux of acid contents it increases mostly when you lie down bent or during the evening and night times it may be triggered by spicy oily food citrus fruits and so on so if it is occasional okay but when it is going to be chronic or if you are suffering heartburn for more than twice or thrice a week then naturally what happens is it should be brought to the attention or medical attention and uh, proper therapeutic measures should be taken so gastroesophageal reflux disease is again because if this sphincter is not functional then contents of the gastric contents might regurgitate into the esophagus or it is also called as acid reflux acid reflux gerd now because of the gerd what happens is it might lead to the barrett's esophagus so chronic gerd might lead to the barrett's esophagus where the normal lining of the esophagus changes into columnar cells from squamous cells what happens is it becomes to columnar cells the lining epithelium changes from esophageal epithelium to the intestinal epithelium so because of this abnormal lining of this iso barrett's it is it is actually called as barrett's esophagus they have a minimal chance of becoming transformed into esophageal carcinoma even though the chances are less once if there is a barrett's esophagus so proper precautions should be taken and regular <coughs> screening must be done if the barrett's esophagus is present so that is all about the applied anatomy of the esophagus i will directly move on to the thoracic duct so largest lymphatic duct or lymphatic vessel in our body almost 45 cm in length so there are many other structures which are 45 cm length in our body femur spinal cord these are few of the structures to name so it mainly drains lymphatic from whole of the body except the right side of your head neck right upper limb then your right thoracic wall and right half of the heart and lung right lung these structures are again drained by the right lymphatic duct which you see here whereas all the remaining actually is drained via the thoracic duct so it is beaded in appearance and also present with valves inside you have the valves and mostly the valves are present where it is subjected to constant pressure formation it starts from the cisterna chile which actually collects a lymph from the intestine at the level of l2 from the upper part of the cisterna chile it starts and enters the thorax via the opening of the aorta descending thoracic aorta where it enters the diaphragm so in front you have the median arcuate ligament behind you have the t12 and to the right side you have the azagos vein then it runs in the posterior mediastinum behind the esophagus it lies posterior to the esophagus then opposite the t5 or intervertebral disc between t4 and t5 it deviates to the 
left side all this time it was present behind and to the right of esophagus but now it actually deviates to the left side at c7 <coughs> it arches at the root of the neck and then opens at the angle between the junction of the internal jugular vein and the subclavian vein left internal jugular vein and left subclavian vein near its termination it is again guarded by a pair of valves again this thoracic duct has a variable termination sometimes many lymphatic ducts instead of single duct in the upper part they might open directly into this junction of the internal jugular vein and subclavian vein or sometimes they might bifurcate right one will go and drain as the junction between the right subclavian and the right internal jugular vein left one is the usual termination of the thoracic duct so that is actually the course and relations of the thoracic duct mainly the tributaries you see the descending lymph trunk okay so a pair of descending lymph trunk they mainly drain the lymph from the lower intercostal spaces and also the upper lumbar region then you have a pair of ascending lymph trunk okay a pair of ascending lymph trunk then it drains lymph from the vessels lymph vessels of posterior mediastinum and intercostal lymph trunks posterior mediastinum and intercostal lymph trunks these are the tributaries left occasional this is occasional left bronchomediastinal lymph trunk then left jugular trunk from the left side of head and neck and right sorry left subclavian trunk for the left upper limb so pair of descending lymph trunk ascending lymph trunk lymph vessels of the posterior mediastinum and the intercostal lymph trunk left jugular and left subclavian lymph trunk these are the tributaries of the thoracic duct if look at the relations of the thoracic duct it is a content of posterior mediastinum so in front it is related front and to the right it is related to the esophagus in the lower part especially the posterior mediastinum but if you look at the superior mediastinum it will be to the left of the esophagus so then we have the sloping surface of the diaphragm they form the anterior relations behind thoracic vertebra termination of the azygos <coughs> not as a mi azygos and the accessory this is accessory mi azygos the blue color line you see here and this blue color line again you see is the hemi azygos they both terminate which is present behind the thoracic duct and of course you have the thoracic vertebra and then the posterior intercostal vessels they form the posterior relations of the thoracic duct right side as i was vein and left side what you have the descending thoracic aorta here which is cut descending thoracic aorta so here you see right side the as i was vein left side descending thoracic aorta behind you see the posterior intercostal vessels vertebra intervertebral discs the termination of accessory hemiazygos and hemiazygos veins they are all from the posterior relations for the thoracic duct with respect to the applied anatomy hylothorax so like pneumothorax you have hydrothorax hemothorax pyothorax this is actually chylothorax intestinal fluid collection chylus hydrocele in the testis then urine which is actually white and milky it's actually called as chylus urine all this is because of when the lymph vessels they burst because it is infected with filarial parasites these parasites when they multiply and grow they will obstruct the drainage of lymph 
and at the same time what happens the lymph vessels might rupture so the lymph from there what happens is might actually get collected as hydrocele in the testis or in the urine chylus urine or in the thorax what happens is accumulation of fluid in the pleura as chylothorax finally we will come to the descending thoracic aorta again a content of posterior mediastinum extend from t4 t4 is the starting and the ending of the arch of aorta the termination at the level of t12 it pierces the diaphragm and continues as the abdominal aorta so t4 to t12 is its extension <coughs> <coughs> it is actually to the left of the vertebral column at its commencement and it becomes anterior near its termination it slowly comes anteriorly to its termination so anteriorly you see the root of the left lung principal bronchus pulmonary veins pulmonary artery pulmonary artery pulmonary veins left side root lung root structures forms the anterior relation then esophagus at the level of t8 and t9 and then pericardium and diaphragm so they form the anterior relation of descending thoracic posteriorly thoracic vertebra and then sympathetic chain and thoracic duct so you are able to see the thoracic duct posteriorly behind that and then the sympathetic chain actually is not shown in this view you can see on the sides of the vertebra the sympathetic chain then of course termination of the mesozygous and accessory mesozygous all this is posterior relations of the descending thoracic aorta the other relations to the left side left lung and pleura and to the right side you have the azygos vein branches can be divided into visceral branches and you see the parietal branches so visceral branches you are able to see pericardial branches mediastinal branches esophageal branches <coughs> to the esophagus okay pericardial mediastinal esophageal and then left bronchial arteries left bronchial is actually from the descending thoracic eye parietal branches are mainly to the body walls subcostal before the subcostal what you see is the nine pairs of posterior intracostal arteries because first two pair superior intracostal arteries they are from the costo cervical trunk the remaining only are the branches from the descending thoracic aorta 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 and the last one is actually called the subcostal arteries <coughs> on either side t12 is actually branch t12 branch at the level is the t12 intercostal space this is a subcostal artery so these are the branches with respect to applied anatomy you have aortic aneurysm so before that the last branch of descending thoracic aorta is the superior phrenic artery same way the first branch of abdominal aorta is the inferior phrenic artery <coughs> abnormal dilatation of the aorta is actually called as aortic aneurysm it is can occur it can occur anywhere the descending or abdominal or even arch of aorta most common is the aortic aneurysm the abdominal part only secondary to that you come across the aneurysm in the thoracic part that is in the descending thoracic aorta so abnormal dilatation and can might also lead to aortic dissection so tearing of the vessel wall is actually called as aortic dissection <coughs> infections from the neck region infections from the neck region especially from the danger zone or danger space which is present in front by the alar fascia and behind by the prevertebral fascia now these infections can track down into the posterior mediastinum 
it is present on either side of the trachea and the esophagus even though there is a midline raphe it can communicate to the either side from the right side to left side or left side to the right side between the alar and the prevertebral fascia these infections can track down retropharyngeal space again infections from this usually does not extend because the fascia behind the pharynx the buccopharyngeal fascia fuses here you are able to see here with the alar fascia pretracheal layer infections from here through the pretracheal fascia can actually enter into the superior mediastinum rather than the posterior mediastinum okay so infections can become bilateral from one side to the other side from the danger space which is between the alar fascia and the prevertebral fascia and they continue into the posterior mediastinum so it may lead to infections or inflammation of the mediastinum called as mediastinitis it can erode the major vessels upper airway or gi sometimes esophagitis perforations in the esophagus what happens from there it can again spread to the posterior mediastinum mediastinal tumors of which 9 to 39 percent arise from the peripheral nerves and from sympathetic and parasympathetic ganglia and embryonic remnants of neural tube which is present so these tumors most common in the posterior mediastinum and they manifest as neurological symptoms it may be a neurogenic tumor mainly the other applied aspects aortic aneurysm as i told you hiatal hernia so through the opening in the diaphragm esophageal opening in the diaphragm sometimes the stomach might slide into the posterior mediastinum tumors of esophagus esophageal cancers then bronchogenic tumors of the lung all these are actually can affect the posterior mediastinum <clears throat> so any of these is a group of symptoms the mediastinal syndrome due to the compression of the mediastinal structures by a growth is most commonly the tumor so if the superior vena cava is compressed then you have venous engorgement in the upper half of the body that is face neck of the affected side and the upper lip because the veins are actually compressed if there is a pressure over the trachea you might get dyspnea difficulty in breathing and cough over the esophagus difficulty in swallowing on the left recurrent laryngeal nerve hoarseness of voice right recurrent laryngeal nerve does not come until the level of the mediastinum because it winds at a higher level on the phrenic nerve hemi paralysis paralysis of the diaphragm on the affected side and intercostal neuralgia pain over the distribution sharp picking or burning pain along the distribution of intercostal nerves is actually called as intercostal neuralgia so any tumor of the mediastinum may produce mediastinal syndrome by compressing vascular structures mostly the veins are affected superior vena cava or it might compress the trachea esophagus and the nerves are left recurrent phrenic and the intercostal nerves so thank you very much for your patient listening